organizations within our denomination. United Methodist, uh, or Uniting Methodist, uh, launched in 2017, and UMC Next launched shortly after General Conference 2019. Of course, these are not the only two, but they are the two with the largest bandwidth in terms of recognition by other progressives and centrists and our denominational media. And they are the two that are most engaged in the ongoing, albeit somewhat unproductive, dialogue with our more traditionalist colleagues. We will look at each of the websites, analyzing their selection of conveners, which is another fancy non-hierarchical term for governing body. Examination of the conveners can give us insights to the distribution of influence and voice present in each organization. Also, by looking at the conveners, we are also given insight to the foundational assumptions about how each organization believes the world works, where knowledge is found, and how problems are solved. Guided in part by a desire to see the One Church Plan succeed, Uniting Methodists state that they are a movement rather than an organization, striving for greater inclusion and genuine representation in pursuit of shared goals. In organizational terms, they're an organization. <laughs> Just over 58% of their leadership are UMC clergy, all elders. 7% are from one United Methodist Seminary. 80% of the laity are institutionally and professionally tied to the United Methodist Church, meaning they have served in conference or gener general agency roles. This leadership team is predominantly heavy with representation from Florida, Washington, Baltimore, Virginia, with a smattering in of individuals from Texas and the Midwest. Emerging after General Conference 2019, UMC Next is a fast becoming the most visible of all the progressive centrist organizations. 64% of this group are all clergy and they're all elders. 19% are openly LGBTQ, those are laity members. And all of the laity are tied to the church institutionally, meaning that they've had some formal paid role with the church. There is also a unique overlap of six leaders on this list that share convening roles on both the UMC Next and the Uniting Methodist. Again, a content analysis can examine unintentional yet enacted communication both of these organizations may have. Just in selecting of their governing boards, we can sort of discern some of the messages that one can glean from their selection. First, your voice is gained at this table with elders' orders and big church pulpits. Secondly, being an institutional insider is a laity ticket to the discussion. And third, it's okay to double dip in the Kool-Aid of influence. After General Conference 2019, in the midst of all of the back and forth, if you read the blogs, the posts, and other social media accounts, you begin to realize that while we were all looking at the way forward and believing and institutionally believing that all of our voices were being represented, there were a number of offline negotiations that were being held between several members of the WCA and centrist progressive leaders. Interestingly, while the traditionalist representatives were publicly known and many of them selected, the progressive centrist leadership that represented us in these offline meetings were not. If we do a network analysis of the centrality of the key individuals of these organizations listed on both websites, it's possible to identify the majority of influence and voice within these organizations is really limited to seven or eight individuals who selected or self-selected themselves to be the negotiators for the progressive centrist leadership. These convening boards also reveal, again, perhaps unintentionally, the governing worldviews about how the church is best run, by whom, where knowledge for transformation truly resides. Allow me to share three of the assumptions that I think are revealed. Number one, only those who are called to order the church can solve the church's problems. The composition of both of these groups, conveners, reflect the assumption that there's only one order of the United Methodist clergy gifted with the knowledge and expertise to lead us through this organizational crisis. But this leads to a second assumption 1A. Of course, I'm a scholar, I gotta have a 1A. <laughs> <coughs> 
if we hold assumption one, then we are assuming that seminary education as previously and currently practiced provides its elder graduates with the skills, knowledge, not only to manage the local church, but to manage the human resources, macro and micro financial implications, economic modeling, anthropological and sociological dictates of a 21st century global diverse organization. We know that's not true. <laughs> Assumption number two, these convening boards also make a statement about the very nature of laity within the church. That only those who are indoctrinated into the inner workings of the denomination are valuable enough to sit at the table with the elders of the church. I'm gonna skip a third assumption. These organizations, when assembled, these assumptions tell us something grave about these two progressive organizations in question. That they are isolated systems. Allow me to explain what I mean. By examining those who are invisible or unaccounted for in both of these organizations, leadership structures, we can see the, con the constituencies and experiment experiential leadership that's absent. Who's absent from this table? Deacons, small church pastors, rural pastors, black church pastors in urban areas that are not large congregations, chaplains, people who are on the front line and countless of other UMC laity who negotiate these issues on a daily basis in their professional lives. The very fact that we're having this conference is an indication that our voice as UMC academics is not even being fully considered or able to be considered within these discussions. Isolated systems, like a burial urn, insulate systems that are meant to be sealed. They're unaffected by new sources of input and unable to expel waste and inefficiency. Frankly, they're sealed. The most basic principle of thermodynamics tells us that in order for transformation to happen, systems must be open, meaning it must have the ability for new sources of input which can be transformed to energy to sustain and transform the system. If a system is not open, it cannot transform. The human body is an excellent example because matter is consumed, it's transformed, and waste is expelled, all because it is open. It only survives because it's open. It thrives when it is given a variety of inputs, not just selective ones. When the system is closed, the body dies. Finally, open systems thrive when given requisite variety. Its inputs must be varied. Water, air, fruit, vegetables, iron, zinc, magnesium. The body cannot survive with only a few select inputs. It ha must have a banquet of nutrients and inputs. With all of this, allow me to offer the following in conclusion. The vast majority of our local churches and annual conference are themselves closed and isolated systems. Innovation and transformation are literally unsustainable. Because most times when you think about it, we would rather replicate effort rather than engage the risk of letting those outside the club engage in leadership. So progressive organizations cannot continue to replicate the isolated systems that assume knowledge only re is resulting in the local United Methodist Church, whether it's large or small. Conclusion number two, regardless of the intentions of our progressive organizations, and I believe they are good, they replicate the same assumptions about power, position, and authority demonstrated by the traditionalist and, frankly, the larger church. Audre Lorde said that you cannot dismantle the master's house with the master's tools. Therefore, it's implausible to believe that an organization that says it's progressive can truly be progressive when power and voice are held by a select few. Since 2008, the so-called progressive leadership has not changed hands. It's only consolidated more voice and institutional power in the same group of individuals. No matter how many people are on these websites, astute observers know that the back room when the negotiations happen will only hold eight chairs. Sadly, all of these things point to what we call affiliation bias, which is the single most guiding attribute of general organizing in the progressive organizations and frankly, most organizations. Affiliation bias happens when despite our best intentions, we select only the people we know, the people we like, the people who think like us. 
the people we went to seminary with, the people that we feel the best with. Frankly, you can't select people you don't know and like. Because it is a warm affiliation, a warm blanket bias, affiliation bias is the silent organizational killer. It, in the end, will kill every organization because it becomes an urn. It is this organizational bias, friends, that I believe will eventually undermine our efforts of true progressive efforts to coalesce and engage real transformation. Because if what we had before is still in control, we're going to have the same results. Or as I like to say in this college football season, if they were a coaching staff, they'd already been fired. So with that, thank you for your time. Thank you.